So the year is 1981. TV anime is booming like never before. A diverse range of stories from comedies, historical dramas, and of course, as always, shows about big robots. Two years ago, Mobile Suit Gundam aired for the first time, and initially it wasn't a huge success, but recently it's been massively picking up steam and reruns. In fact, the fandom is kind of reaching a fever pitch. It's attracting a surprising mix of types too. Military otaku and sci-fi enthusiasts obviously love it, but it's also being championed by the burgeoning BL scene, who really like Shar Aznable and Garma's Abbey. Honestly, who can blame them? So now, people are hungry for more Gundam material. The first of the free Gundam compilation movies are going to be released that year, and the event that announces the next two will bring in about 1,500 people, one of the largest public gatherings in Shinjuku since the leftist Anpo riots of the 60s. So gosh darn, people are hungry for more new Gundam. But its sequel series wouldn't come until 1985, a whole four years later. Still, Gundam Studio Sunrise knew they had to capitalize on this boom, so the early 80s saw a slew of Gundam-like mecha shows. One of the first of these is also my favorite, Fang of the Sun Dogrum, directed by Ryosuke Takahashi. Dogrum has a pretty similar setup to the original Gundam. It's about a war between this big United Earth government and a colony, in this case the terraformed desert planet Deloyer. Dogrum, though, follows Kryn Kashim, an Earth boy and the son of a politician in charge of the occupation on Deloyer. The planet's people are beginning to want independence from the Earth. Guerrilla groups are forming, and they're fighting against the Federation's brutal occupying forces. The first 10 episodes or so chart Kryn's slow disillusionment with the Federation and his eventual joining of a pro-independence group, the titular Fang of the Sun. Here's how I would pitch this show. Dogram to me feels like the most extreme example of the idea of a real robot series. It's a show that is intensely interested in the mechanics of its world and trusts that its audience will be too. It's a long anime, 75 episodes, but it uses that time to give every part of its setting a lot of depth. I have a certain love for dry political sci-fi, you know, the kind of thing that has this real history dad energy. Andor is also scratching that itch for me right now, and Dogrim is that to a T. It has guerrilla action and mecha stuff, but this is also a series that devotes entire episodes to subjects like farming land reform. That's not a joke, there's a whole two episode arc about farming land reform. <laughs> And despite the similarities to Gundam, you might have noticed a pretty big difference in my plot description. In the original Gundam, the independence movement has been hijacked by awful fascists who really need to be taken out. The setting of Gundam is in shades of grey, but there's no doubt whatsoever that the Zabi family are the real antagonists. In Dogrum, the liberation movement are the protagonists of the story, and we follow as they go from decentralized bands of guerrillas to establishing a real government and functioning state. And we see all the difficulties and responsibilities that go along with that transformation. Basically, this is the kind of show that could only have come out in that immediate post-Gundam period. That time when creators knew people wanted more realistic mecha stories, and in turn, they were willing to push that style as far as possible. An idea you come across a lot in genre circles is that science fiction isn't really about the future, it's about the present. And Dogram could probably be accused of taking this idea a little too literally. You've got interstellar travel and terraforming, and Lure has a few sci-fi conceits, like a twin sun, but Otherwise, it doesn't really attempt to imagine a radically different future. The lawyer doesn't hold any strange alien species, and in fact the animals we see are all from Earth. Its environments are reminiscent of a mix of North Africa and South America, and the fashion is decidedly late 70s, early 80s, with character designs looking straight out of a news report from that time. Ditto for Earth, which, when we see it, basically looks like 1970s Europe. In fact, the elite families seem to be moving culturally backwards in time, not forwards, embracing the fashion and lifestyle of, like, Victorian European nobility. Aside from the combat armors, the mecha suits of the series, the technology is pretty mid-20th century, with print newspapers, thick TVs, and even wired telephones. So it's not really a series that tries to imagine how culture would actually shift in the far future, but I think criticizing this would be kind of misunderstanding what Dogrum is doing. It uses the lawyer as a kind of massive outsized setting to explore the imagery of the post-colonial conflicts that were happening at the time. 
And I think there's a real effort in Dogram not to try and project its imagery forward too much, to go for a documentary-esque style. Sci-fi always dates very quickly because it very rapidly becomes a vision of the future from the past. That can become its own sort of prize aesthetic, just like a cyberpunk. But Dogram has taken on a kind of historical weight because it's trying to look so unremarkably early 80s. In order to attain this level of immediacy, watching it now looks like watching grimy news reports in a faraway conflict. So that is to say that I don't think Dogram is really interested in high concept sci-fi ideas. It's more about imagining the political strife between two entities and ideologies, and on that level, it's kind of unmatched. There is so much detail to this world's setting. It helps that the series really takes its time. We start for an episode on Earth where we see the massive gap between rich and poor and the effects of anti-lawyer propaganda. Then we have several episodes before war fully breaks out on the lawyer, where we witness what the Federation's occupation is like on a day-to-day -day level, as well as the burgeoning independence movement. As the show goes on, we learn about the Federation's justifications for their actions, and in both factions we meet ideologues and manipulators, liberals and conservatives, and a whole lot of regular people affected by the conflict in different ways. By the end, I felt like I understood this world better than pretty much any other anime setting. That's what really impressed me about this series. No grip is ever a monolith, neither the Earth Federation nor the Deloyan people, and we always see how the actions of states have multiple cascading consequences. In fact, something I started to notice as the show went on is that pretty much whenever a faction made a big decision, it always had about three major consequences in the plot, usually two of them intended and one of them not. Let me give an example. So I'll begin by just laying out the political setup of the series. Earth colonized a lawyer about 150 years ago, and in that time, the planet has developed its own culture. They've got their own songs, their own customs, there's basically a discrete DeLorean people at this point. But they're also the backbone of Earth's economy, because the Earth's environment has totally collapsed. So DeLorean produces most of the food, and most of the other resources too. Still, DeLorean is dominated by big Earth monopolies. Most DeLoreans live in poverty, while these monopolies generate huge amounts of wealth for Earth's elite. Not only that, DeLoreans are under extreme military occupation day in, day out. And back on Earth, it's not much better. DeLorean migrant workers there face violence and discrimination. Discrimination. So there's tension on Delore. There's been bombing campaigns against Federation bases, and even pockets of armed resistance breaking out in some areas. Basically, things are heating up, and it's becoming clear that something in the relationship between these two planets needs to change. So Kryn's father, Denon Cashin, is a politician, and he's basically the head of the Federation government. The plot is set in motion when he declares that the next Federation Council meeting will be held on the lawyer. That might sound mundane, but it causes a stir because that's never happened before. The lawyer has been viewed as a colony with no real representation granted to it. So this act begins to cause rumors. People are suggesting that Deloria will soon be announced as Earth's new estate with equal rights and representation. And this would make sense, like clearly something needs to be done to stop a full-blown resistance from breaking out. So Denon reaches the planet, but things don't go as planned. He and every other politician attending the meeting are kidnapped, supposedly by rebel forces. His son, Kryn, is in military school, and he ends up involved in an operation to save his dad. That's sort of what the first five episodes are about. And they do, they defeat the rebels and save the politicians. And afterwards, Denon immediately announces that Deloria will finally be granted statehood. He says that the two planets are reaching a new stage of friendship. So, you know, problem solved, right? Except things quickly don't seem right. Delora has made a state, but they aren't given a democratic government like the rest of the Federation. Instead, they're put under the command of a military provisional government, who, in the next few days, go about violently cracking down on all the guerrillas who revealed themselves during the coup. So you might see where this is going. There was never actually a real hostage situation. It was just an excuse to make the rebels reveal themselves and take them out. And the new supposedly independent lawyer, it's really just a puppet government, totally subservient to Earth. It creates the illusion of change and progress, but really nothing has altered. And in fact, this new arrangement benefits Earth in a bunch of ways. And oh boy, does this anime show us those ways. When I first realized how granular the politics were gonna get in this opening arc, I was like rubbing my hands together with glee. I was full on the Onion comic sicko meme, this was the point at which I was like, okay, yeah, no, this show is absolutely made for crazy people like me. Let's get as dry and esoteric as we can go. So let me get into it. So part of it is that the Federation claims that the Separatist rebels were actually headed by a group of Earth politicians who they say want to profit of an independent planet. This is completely false, but it allows for a kind of ideological attack. Through this false story, Earth can basically argue that the entire movement for an independent planet was being instigated by greedy financial interests. And the Earth Federation can portray themselves not as a colonial force, but an egalitarian one, protecting Deloria from sinister financial conglomerates. And there's another thing about it. Now the violence against Deloreans can continue, but the central Earth government can distance themselves from it. 
saying it's an unfortunate decision taken by the planet's autonomous local administration. And they couldn't possibly infringe on that government's decision making, could they? See what I mean? There's just so many wrinkles to every bit of political theatre in this thing. What I find really interesting here, and this goes for the show as a whole, is that Earth never uses outright fascist language to justify their rule. Instead, they say throughout that Earth and Lawyer have an equal partnership, and that only a small minority of citizens want full-blown independence. At other times, when justifying military occupation, they argue that Lawyer cannot become a full-fledged democracy immediately, that it needs to experience a gradual cultural development until it can function like Earth does. <laughs> デロイヤはまだ歩き始めたばかりだ。文明の成熟度において有し数千年の地球に比べ数段落ちるのはやむを得んことだ。デロイヤが一定レベルの民度に達し、文明を成熟させるには中央集中型の強力な指導が必要であ
ないのではない。あいつはわしの血を引いているんだ。They're kind of parallels. Denon, an embodiment of conservatism, and Crin, a radical revolutionary. It's a neat dynamic and it provides a lot of pathos. Denon also has this really intimate, thoughtful relationship with his wife that I was kind of blown away by. I mean, how often in media, let alone in anime, do you see sensitively portrayed middle aged relationships? As it goes on, there are these remarkably quiet scenes between them. It's just such a surprisingly believable depiction of this marriage that's weathered a bunch of years. I really wish more anime would do this with its antagonists. When you see that someone has a relatable home life, it does a lot to make them a real person. Moving on, on the Federation side, we also have a lot of generals beneath Denon, in charge of the day to day occupation of the lawyer. You've got von Stein, who's in charge of the military provisional government. He's largely a career general. He's repressive and violent in his tactics, but also demurring when it comes to authority, and afraid of those he perceives as being of higher stature than him, particularly Earth's industrial corporations. We often see him second guessing his decisions, worrying he'll offend them. He's also a Deloyerin, though one who seems to have absorbed every bit of anti Deloyer sentiment from Earth and internalized it. Then you have Rick Boyd, who's a really interesting character and very much on the other end of the spectrum. He's Earthborn, but a much more liberal individual, and he's clearly concerned by the military's infringement on civil rights. He's the one I mentioned who is made administrator of the city of Palmina. Actually, the first thing he does when he's made administrator is give a speech where he basically completely acknowledges why that area has so much rebellion. <laughs> He often comes up against the problem of being a very conflict adverse individual in a very violent military structure. When his first order to his troops are for them to carry out an opinion poll among the populace, the show hard cuts to some of the soldiers saying, New administrator sucks ass. He's kind of a naive figure, and I'm not sure we're meant to like him, at least not in an uncomplicated way. He's someone who seems to genuinely believe that the Federation's brutal tactics are just a temporary measure to bring about peace. So he sees situations like Palmina's and assumes that the inequities are flaws in an overall correct system, rather than, you know, the system working as intended. He clearly has good intentions, though, and I really like his episodes. They tend to be really granular political stories of him trying to fix systems that can't be fixed. Uh, there's the one I previously mentioned about farming land reform. That's him. He also tries to fix the discrimination against lawyers within the military. The other Federation character I have to mention is Lakoku. This guy starts off as Denon's secretary, but he slowly moves up the ranks as the show goes on. In fact, you could argue that the real story of Dogram is this guy's rise to power. He is also basically the devil himself. Combine Shar Atmel's backstabbing with Reinhard von Lohengram's political Machiavellianism, and you have something approaching the character of Lakoku. But what makes him particularly dangerous is that he barely seems to have any real ideology of his own. He's earthborn, but you never get the sense he has any real opinions on Delore. Instead, he's driven only by a cold hearted lust for power and a desire to be at the height of every hierarchy he encounters. He's pretty much my favorite example of that master manipulator archetype in anime. You know the kind I mean. You can see it in Light and Death Note or Lelouch and Code Geass. Lokoku is adept at getting what he wants from someone while making them feel as if they're getting one over on him. He also really likes to play the long game. It's not unusual for him to set something in motion that will only pay off like 20 or so episodes down the line. Something I really like is that Denon actually figures out pretty fast. Oh shit, I think my secretary is kind of a power grabbing sociopath. There's a scene about midway through the show where he says to someone, Lokoku is a sharp politician, but he lacks virtue. And it very much has the energy of Lennon being all, uh, Stalin is really coarse. Please don't make him secretary general after I die. But yeah, Lokoku really only takes center stage in the last 25 episodes or so, at which point it really starts to feel like you're watching some kind of HBO drama from the 2000s. Apparently at the time, some fans were annoyed that it seemed like he became the main character, and I get that, but it worked for me. You know there's no real sympathizing this guy, but he is always engaging.
So on the guerrilla side, you have Samlin, this academic who's become the leader of the resistance. He's a very pragmatic revolutionary figure, trying to wrangle together all these disparate groups into a coherent force. I like Samlin, but he does sort of have this issue I find with a lot of the resistance characters, which is for some reason I just don't find them as interesting as their federation counterparts. I'm not really sure why that is, except that they just feel a little one note. I think part of it is that the Federation ones are just so flawed and human, so Shakespearean in the amount of backstabbing they do. I mean, there is that on the Resistance side too, they have their own moral quandaries, but like less so. There are some good examples, like there's an episode where this corporation offers to help Samlin, but only if he uses his forces to destroy a rival corporate plant, and then Samlin has to like deal with whether or not to do that, and you know, alienate all the people who work for that rival company. Stuff like that is really cool, but they're just slightly more one note than their Federation counterparts. I sort of feel similarly about Kryn, our main character. Most mecha anime from this period function as kind of coming of age stories, right? In which a troubled youth who represents you, the viewer, is forced to mature over the course of a war. Consequently, these are usually works of melodrama, with characters who are very outsized in how they articulate and navigate their many neuroses and internal conflicts. I really like a lot of protagonists from this period, like Camille, who's a very damaged little punk, mostly of a heart of gold, but also kind of a little shit, or Amaro, the paranoid proto otaku Shaden. Kryn is actually a lot less neurotic than these characters, and at times he takes a backseat to the rest of the plot. He's probably at his most interesting when he starts to reckon with his own identity as an Earthborn, fighting for the DeLoreans, and that does lead to some pretty cool drama, but overall, he's just kind of fine. He gets the job done. And then there's the other members of Kryn's guerrilla group. The website Cries of the New Type notes that when magazines did character diagrams to keep track of the show's cast, you know, at the time, these characters were all put into one box. And they definitely aren't the real movers of the story. Takashi actually even said this himself. Despite Kryn and his gang being our main characters, at the end of the day, this is a story that revolves around the acts of the various adults, like Donan, Samalin, Lokoku, and Kama. Though personally, I'd say I like these characters well enough. There's Rocky, who's kind of your typical Gekiga style biker. There's also Canary, she's pretty kick ass. But yeah, I wouldn't say any of these characters are super three dimensional, and they do kind of fall to the side as the show goes on. In fact, by its end, Dogram makes sure to tie up all the narrative loose ends of the politicians, but a lot of the Fang and the Sun members have pretty unresolved story arcs. Basically, I don't think any of these characters are as interesting as, say, the white based crew from Original Gundam, but they're satisfactory. I do love though that because this is an early 80s anime, they like had to get a kid self insert in there so that you, 8 year old viewer in Japan, can imagine that you too are helping to murder imperialist occupiers. So there's this kid Billy, and his presence definitely made some scenes that otherwise had pathos kind of funny. Yeah, kid, I. I don't know if you should be here. Daisy! Daisy is Kryn's childhood sweetheart, who travels to Laura to find him, and at first I was really worried she'd be a one-dimensional love interest, just yearning after him, and that's what it seemed like for a while. But they end up doing something really cool with her. She ends up gaining independence from her former life just like Kryn did. She becomes a nurse on Deloyer, and experiences the conflict in a very intimate way. Her episodes become some of my favourites, and her interactions with Kryn are really good. They both want to be with each other, but they've also both found roles more important than their individual needs during the conflict. It's surprisingly emotionally engaging, I was really impressed by what they did with her. So yeah, I really like the cast, but really especially on the Federation side. Also in general, there's just lots of really subtle non-verbal storytelling in this show. Like this shot of soldiers rolling their eyes during one of Boyd's speeches. Or this moment when a resistance spy, trying to cozy up to Lokoku, reaches out to light his cigar. Lokoku rolls his eyes and brings out his own lighter, shunning him away. Great stuff. Or this moment when a politician, so caught up in Lokoku's speech, doesn't realize his whole cigar has burnt away. These kind of things often say more than dialogue could. Side note, there is weirdly so much smoking in this anime. Like, a concerning amount of smoking. Real Kimigiri Orange Road slash Flintstones commercial energy in that regard. I got a better idea. Let's take a Winston break. That's it! Winston is the one filter cigarette that delivers flavor 20 times a pack. Winston's got that filter blend. Yeah, Fred. Shikashi, Monday Temo Ikuska no Kosaratimas. Dogram is a pretty ugly show. It almost seems to make ugliness its aesthetic. Almost every character has receding hairline, people are wrinkled and weathered, and there's so many scenes that take place in beige offices or cramped newsrooms. 
It's pretty clear they want this to feel documentary-like. The compilation movie they eventually made is literally called Dogram, a documentary. If this show had a smell, it would be gasoline and cigarettes. I have a certain fondness for this, just because it's such an unusual aesthetic for an anime to have. Like, how many series are there where most of the designs look like character actors? If I was fan casting for a live-action Dogram, I'd imagine actors like late-era Marlon Brando, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and maybe Paul Giamatti as a treat. Lying to us, Kenny! Kenny! He is lying to us! The thing that is less excusable is the animation itself, which is, a. Uh, it's pretty jank. The first 10 episodes are maybe some of the worst animated stuff I've seen from Major Studio. You've got a lot of really wonky perspectives, weightless movement, and just some really, really crusty line drawings. And then there's a period in the kind of 20s and 30s where it's like the characters were never on model. I swear, there was one episode where it looked like Kryn was just morphing in front of my eyes, like some sort of non-Euclidean being. What's happening to you, Kryn? Another weird quirk, for some reason every other episode or so, the characters will just be incredibly buff. Like, He-Man level muscles. That's not so bad, obviously, it's just kind of jarring. Though I will say, Dogum is one of the few anime I've seen that actually looks better as it goes on. Weirdly, once you get into the late 40s, the detail goes massively up. I've read that Dogum was actually initially planned to be 50-something episodes and was extended due to good ratings. If that's true, maybe this was a case where initially Sunrise didn't expect much from the show, and then it moved more talent to it once it became a hit. There's a really weird whiplash though, where you've dealt with the jankest animation for like 40 episodes, and you've kind of gotten used to it, and then suddenly it's occasionally OAV quality. Like look at this detail towards the end, they animated the Dogram's antenna swinging back and forth. And while the animation is usually pretty bad, the actual directing and editing is solid. Not like mind-blowing, but there's some craft here for sure. Director Takashi isn't someone I think of as like a supreme visual stylist. He's not like, say, Osamu Dezaki, where I'll constantly be floored by how smart his editing, or Yoshiki Tomino, where I just have to give it to him because he's so unique and bizarre in his style. But I would say that Takahashi is a good workman-like director, with a kind of no-nonsense approach. And I think something he shows off really well in this series is his ability to build tension in a sort of classic Hollywood style. Like, take this scene where a spy cuts a bomb wire, and then we cut to what initially seems like the light of an explosion, but a few seconds later, we realize it's actually from a spotlight. Or this one episode where Kryn is working on the Dogram in a factory on a stormy night, and then lightning strikes. And every time it does, we see an enemy mech outside getting closer and closer. It's just some cool, theatrical, kind of classic tension building stuff. Still, the show's ugliness does make it really hard to recommend, but if I wanted to make a case for that element, I'd say it kind of reinforces the grimy atmosphere. We're meant to feel that the lawyer is, as one character puts it, hell itself, and the show being so horrible to look at kind of reinforces that, even if it's unintentional. The real weak link for me in the aesthetic are the mecha themselves. Don't get me wrong, I don't think they're bad designs. I just don't know if they're that memorable. This guy, the round facer, is sort of nice, but he's basically a slightly brushed up Zaku from Gundam and fulfills a similar plot purpose of being a kind of modular grunt suit. And I'd say the Zaku is more character. It's got that cyclopean eye and a spiky shoulder. And the rest of the designs are, are nice, I guess, but not that distinctive. I like this guy, the blockhead. It's kind of cute that they have turrets for heads. But overall, it's just hard not for me to see Dogram's designs as kind of an awkward middle ground between stylized and realism. I know these mecha designs have a following, largely because they're were licensed and repurposed for the Western tabletop game Battletech. And actually, those slight redesigns I think are really nice. I just don't think Dogum's design stood out enough to remain in the otaku imagination, you know? Also, there's just no really getting around the fact that these designs don't really fit the show's aesthetic or plot purposes. This show is primarily based around a lot of guerrilla combat and urban warfare, with these decentralized terrorist groups fighting against occupying forces. And it's just really hard to see why a 10 meter tall robot would be necessary in that setting. And this leads to a lot of plot contrivances too, especially in the first half of the show, where they have to explain how they're getting these massive weapons in and out of enemy territory, sometimes even breaking the Dogram down into parts and transporting it by truck. Don't get me wrong, some suspension of disbelief is always required in Mecha, and these actually are a fair bit smaller than Gundam's. But Gundam usually presents its big robots more like jets, deployed by large-scale battleships in the vastness of space, where size is obviously relative. Dogram's machines are more like these lumbering tanks, but often used in stealth and tactical missions, which, yeah, I just don't know how convincing that can be. 
funnily enough, Takashi would basically right after this do a series of mecha designs much more suited to Dogren's plot. The TAs in Arma Trooper Votoms are only around 4 meters tall, basically jeeps or tanks, and they're fairly disposable, made plentiful by a hundred year war between two super states. It would feel a lot less jarring, I think, if designs like these were weaving through the lawyer streets, rather than Dogram's kind of awkward and clumsy combat armors. In fact, even Takashi has talked about Votoms as a project in which he tried to see how far he could push the realism that was developing in Dogram. He said, in the concept stage, it was more a matter of making preparations rather than creating. For example, whether or not a 4 meter tall robot would be acceptable. The robots in Dugram were a little over 8 meters tall. I thought that if I were to replace the robot in Dugram with a weapon, I would depict it as a tank. However, when I tried to depict an 8 meter tall robot in the field of animation, they're all strong and large whether they're 8 meters or 50 meters tall. Otaku may know the difference between Dugram and Gundam but others won't be able to differentiate between the two. Though there are some things I really like about the mecha in this series. For one, the way they're presented is very tactile. They don't function perfectly in every environment. They need pretty consistent upkeep, and the Dogram itself occasionally suffers inoperable limbs and broken down systems. And it satisfies a little nerd quibble I had with some mech series from this time. In Dogram, when enemy territory is captured, they'll also take on the equipment and mecha of the opposing side, integrating it into their forces. It always seemed kind of strange to me in the original Gundam how the Federation never seemed to use any captured Zakus or anything. They just stuck to their own equipment. I'm sure there's probably some kind of war reason for this, but I still appreciate the converse in Dogram. Though something you might have caught on to if you've seen a lot of my Gundam videos is that while I love the mecha genre, mecha battles themselves aren't always the biggest draw for me. To be honest, I just have a certain love for political sci-fi, and in anime a bunch of those stories are told, but usually with mecha. I do have some affection for big robots, though from that angle it usually ends up being the super robot stuff I really go for. If you asked which series had my favourite battle choreography, I don't think any Gundam show would rank, certainly Dogram wouldn't. It'd probably be Giant Robo or Shin Getter Robo. You know, something of a lot of spectacle. In fact, this is something I sort of struggle with a lot in 80s real robot stuff. Oftentimes I kind of glaze over during the battles. I don't know, it's like my brain just struggles to follow it. To note here, I also find a lot of shonen battle stuff really hard to focus on, so I think this is just something about the way my brain is wired. I like Dogum's battles though, they're a nice mix of ground combat mixed in with mecha stuff, and the series does a good job of setting the stakes of each encounter. What I found really impressive though was the show's depiction of radical action, which is surprisingly non-judgmental and unestheticized. Death in Dogum is very often random, disarming, and without bravado. I won't spoil who it is, but the show's first major character death comes not from a defiant last stand or sacrificing oneself for the greater good. Instead, it's a completely avoidable, tragic, and random accident involving, I kid you not, an improperly stored grenade. Towards the back half of the show, as the ostensible main characters get pushed more and more to the sidelines, when they do have arcs, it becomes fixated on the guilt they feel, functioning basically as tips of the liberation movement's spear. Kryn and friends have a very high body count in this series, and in the first half, it's easier not to question that, right? Because they're on the back foot, they're trying desperately to survive in enemy territory. But once the balance of power begins to shift, and the guerrillas start taking territory, the show really fixates on this question of their role in the conflict. Kind of unavoidable when so much of their character progression becomes how they become stronger and more effective killing machines. And this show doesn't really come to any hard conclusions on any of this. We don't really know how these characters are going to look back on their actions in the war. At times throughout the show, they do question whether what they're doing is right, but often they're just doing their best to survive. <laughs>
Hey folks, video's not over, I just wanted to do a little plug for my Patreon. The nature of my videos is such that the vast majority are demonetized, and that's fine, but if you like my stuff and you'd like to support me, then I'd be super grateful. I'd also like to thank my first two patrons, Sam Pear and Devilman Gundam. I really appreciate it, guys. Okay, back to the show. 75 episodes is a long show, but Dogum uses its runtime really well. If the first half of the series is all about laying out the oppression faced by Delorians and the reasons why a revolution is necessary, then the second becomes about exploring the Federation, showing that it's not a monolith either and has its own tensions. We learn, for instance, that the Federation is made up of a number of distinct states. The Kashim family belongs to the state of Mediol, which is by far the strongest economic player, and tensions are beginning to brew with the other, less powerful members. Some of the weaker states are beginning to think that Dolores independence might be inevitable, and if that's the case, they'd rather be on good terms with the planet when it happens. Consequently, some corporations within these states actually begin selling weapons secretly to the guerrillas. And we learn a lot about the Federation military. We find out that while most of the Earth Federation officers are Earthborn, more than 80% of the boots on the ground soldiers are Delorean. And these Deloreans aren't even necessarily ideologically motivated. It's explicitly said that most of them joined the military simply because the economy had crashed, and it became one of the few ways to find steady work. So you have an occupying military force largely made up of the native population, who aren't even necessarily in favour of said occupation. And that's creating a lot of unease. As things heat up in occupied territories, some officers are starting to feel outnumbered by their Delorean soldiers, and they're questioning their loyalty. This leads to one of my favourite scenes in the whole show, where a group of Federation soldiers refuse to execute captured guerrillas. It's really tense stuff. I would say more tense than any mecha fight in the whole show. Criticism of the show at the time was that, as it went on, it was veering more towards political drama than mecha series. I think this is definitely true, like, if I were to describe it in sitcom terms, in the first half of the show, a typical episode will have an A plot about whatever Crin and the gang are doing, and a smaller B plot about whatever political stuff is happening. In the second half, that becomes reversed. The Fang and the Sun are kind of reduced to cogs in a larger machine, and really by the end it's Lukoku and his plans that are the driving force. The whole thing builds to an extremely bittersweet ending. You expect this from the start, the first episode opens in the future with Canary stumbling across the wreckage of the Dorum, and the series is sort of framed as her melancholy remembrance of the conflict. But how it plays out is depressing in a way I actually didn't expect. Skip to this timecode if you want to be completely unspoiled. I'll be sort of dancing around how Dorum ends, but you might be able to kind of infer what I mean anyway. So you know, there's this type of depressing mecha ending that I think we all sort of instinctively recognise, where a whole bunch of characters die in usually a sort of base under siege scenario. And then you also have a lot of mecha shows that kind of end in this like transcendent bittersweet apocalypse, you know, your Ideons and Evangelions and stuff. Dogram's ending doesn't really fit into either of these categories. Instead, it's this very strange intentional anticlimax. In fact, the last five episodes or so really become about accepting imperfect situations, which probably shouldn't have been too surprising. Like, since the start of this series, it's been really fixated on the way revolutions can be hijacked or co-opted. But man, it is still a remarkably hard pill to swallow after 75 episodes. I know I'm talking about this really vaguely, but yeah, I think it's going to be a couple of years before I can really say how I feel about Dogram's ending. Because right now, I feel like it's simultaneously really gutsy and conceptually impressive, and also deeply unsatisfying, but also that seems to be the point, so yeah, check back in like five years and I'll let you know what I think. Sometimes you just really have to chew on these endings for a while. Not justice. I want to get truth. One of the first things I remember hearing about Dorum when I first watched it in like 2011 was that it was inspired by this film from the 60s called Battle of Algiers. This was repeated so many times in so many different contexts that I just assumed it was taken from an interview somewhere. But after extensive googling, I can't find any place where Takashi has said this. I actually got a chance to meet Takashi during a Q&A in 2011 at a film screening in Edinburgh held by Scott and Los Anime. I wish I asked at the time this movie was an influence. He did mention a bunch of film directors, like he's clearly a cinephile, but I don't remember if Battle of Algiers was mentioned. 
I can see why the comparison has been made though. Battle of Algiers is kind of the film about guerrilla warfare. Its director, Gilo Pontecorvo, was a committed leftist, and he supported the Algerian cause. The film is about the Algerian War of Independence. But his movie goes for a detached documentary style that tries as much as possible to present its conflict without judgement. Violence is really unestheticized, but also not shied away from. And it's primarily a movie about an empire trying to maintain control, fighting a war where it's hard to sort civilian from enemy. This is also a movie that was screened by the Pentagon in 2002, uh, you know, before the Iraq War. It's also probably the most cramped feeling war movie I've ever seen. So much of it takes place in secret hiding places, and the streets of Algiers feel very serpentine in the harsh black and white. Obviously, by the way, a mecha series from 1981 is not going to reach these artistic heights. I, I love Dogram with all my heart, but let's be clear, it's a robot show that happens to have some really cool world building. It's not a masterpiece of post-colonial art like Ponte Corvo's film. But I can see some potential influence on the imagery. The nondescript Federation offices and the cramped newsrooms are pretty reminiscent of some of the film's locales. This is especially true in the film version, which renders several key scenes in black and white. There's also a few scenes that do seem like direct parallels. This famous bombing scene seems to be homaged in this episode. Also, I think if Algiers was a primary influence, then that would also explain why the fashion in Dogrum isn't just not futuristic, it's kind of antiquated. I mean, look at Daisy's outfit, it looks positively 1960s. It might be that they were just that indebted to Ponte Corvo's mid 20th century movie. By the way, while I have you, and you know, Skip to this time code if you just want to hear about anime. But there's another film by Ponte Corvo that I think has some parallels with Dogram. I don't know if it was an explicit influence, but it covers similar ideas of puppet governments, the ways in which revolutions can be co-opted, and yeah, stuff like that. K. Mada follows a British agent, William Walker, who sets about bringing independence to a lesser Antilles island under Portuguese occupation. Walker, though, isn't actually interested in independence for any ideological reasons. He just wants to bring about a situation that gives the Portuguese a black eye and opens up the island's sugarcane production to British trade. In order to do so, he has to appeal to the different factions wanting independence, including financial interests, as well as the movement to end slavery on the island. Which do you find more convenient? Foreign domination with its laws, its vetoes, its taxes, its commercial monopolies, or independence? With your own government, your own laws, your own administration, and the freedom to trade with anyone you like. On terms that are dictated only by the prices on the international market. Not only for the freedom of trade, Mr. Walker. I believe that for many of us there are idealistic motives which are even more important. Eventually, Walker succeeds in playing off the different factions, as well as in creating a revolutionary in the form of the figure of Jose de Lares, ultimately bringing about independence from Portugal. But the revolution, by the British government's design, only brings about a puppet state, controlled by the British sugar industry. And ten years later, Walker is brought back to the island to repress a revolution, this time directed against the British occupiers, but once again headed by José de Lares, their makeshift revolutionary. March 7th, 1847, the Republic of Quemada cedes to the Antilles Royal Sugar Company the right of exploitation of the sugar plantation for 99 years renewable. Why don't you mention the commitments of the Royal Sugar Company towards Quemada? Uh, because, Mr. President, that is not the most important aspect of the problem. And is it not important that my company has already built a hospital and 50 miles of road? No, Mr. Sheldon. But what is important is that the Royal Sugar Company controls in practice the entire economy of Kemada, whilst the government of Kemada, in practice, no longer controls anything. You're forgetting, Sir William. You were asked here to put down a revolt and not to concern yourself with our government's policies. Yes, well, without these policies, there, there wouldn't be any revolution, Mr. President. Looking back, Brando's character in this movie was kind of an archetype in 1960s political epics. Lawrence and Lawrence of Arabia is kind of a similar idea, right? These agents of empire who go about setting different factions against each other. And both of these movies are interested in these colonial agents as weirdly non-ideological beings. They're instruments of ideology, instruments of empire, but their personal motives are a mystery even to themselves. Though in Lawrence's case, the battlefield is implied to function as a sadomasochistic release valve. And in Walker's, well, he says... I don't know, I'm not just quite sure what I'm doing here. Perhaps it's only for the pleasure of it, or perhaps I'm unable to do anything else. Perhaps I have nothing else to do, but I do know that whenever I try to do something, I try to do it well. By the end of the film, Ponte Corvo parallels Walker with Jose de Lares. 
Dolares was formed by the British government, but he's now a sincere revolutionary, someone who fights for a right and good moral purpose. On the other hand, Walker, despite his superficial charm, is an empty figure, setting different factions against one another while having no real beliefs of his own. And ultimately, if Walker were to die, it'd be fairly meaningless, just another agent provocateur disappearing far from home. But if Dolores dies, he becomes a martyr for his cause. But you see, the man that, that fights for an idea is a hero. And uh, a hero who's killed becomes a martyr, and a martyr immediately becomes a myth. As an aside, can I say just how fucking amazing Marlon Brando is in this movie? I mean, like, no shit, it's Marlon Brando, turns out he's a good actor, who knew? But gosh darn, he is amazing in this role. Just captures the perfect cadence of a detached colonial administrator. Anyway, yeah, did movies like this have a direct influence on Dogram? I don't know, I really wish I'd asked that question to Takahashi when I had the chance. What I do think is clear is that these kind of political epics were just way more in the culture back then. I'm not sure that's still the case anymore. Anyway, all of that is really just to say that Dogram is very much the sum of its cultural parts, and the very different expectations we had from media at the time. It's also an excuse to say that y'all should watch Kim Adam. Documento. Dogram. Dogram ends in such a way where you would really think it was trying to set up sequels. When I went to that Q&A, my one question was not very interesting. I asked Takashi if he would ever do a sequel to Dogram. That's not what I'd ask now. I have new dumb questions. Like, hey, did Yukio Mishima inspire the antagonists in Gasaraki? And for real, did, did Battle of Algiers inspire Dogram? And what do you think of Marlon Brando's performance in Kamada? Do you agree that Paul Giamatti is the greatest actor of his generation? Kenny! He is lying to us! Anyway, I, I was 18 and I thought Dogram was really cool, so that's what I asked. He said no, he, he wouldn't do a sequel. He really dislikes sequels in fact, and he only produced the Votoms ones because there was so much fan demand. By the way, something I wonder about a lot now is like, what was going through Takashi's mind in that moment? Was he surprised that this show he worked on 30 years previously had a fan in Scotland? A place where it was never legally released? He was probably like, god damn, these otakus are everywhere, I literally cannot escape them. Dogram ends in a situation where, without spoiling it, the new political scenario is very unstable, and there's kind of no way it's not going to explode again, but in a very new way in a couple of years. So I do wonder if there was ever any attempts or discussions about doing a kind of Dogram Zeta. And you know, the show was a huge hit, but it didn't happen. So what new material did we get after the show? Well, really, not that much. The last really major project was a compilation movie in 1983 called Dogram, a documentary. This film was a really neat idea. It's presented as an in-universe documentary about the Delorean conflict from start to finish, with narration further contextualizing the events. Unfortunately though, it's just not a very effective movie. It's pretty much a case study, in fact, in all the ways these compilations can go wrong. It's super rushed, has to sail right by any character moments, and I imagine it wouldn't really make sense to anyone not familiar with the show. And by the way, it's not really satisfying if you have seen the show. One of the great things about Dogram is that it always really earns and justifies its big narrative events, but the movie has to move so fast that those moments just kind of happen with no build-up. One example is the Ulna base arc. In the show, we slowly see over the course of the series the discrimination faced by Dlorians in the Federation military, and the increasing tension on Federation bases as a result. In the movie, it just smash cuts to the end of that incident with none of the dramatic build-up. Pacing is also all over the place. The first like 10 minutes or so cover basically the first 10 episodes. Then from minute 25 to minute 36, it just speed runs through episodes 10 to 60. Or more accurately, it just skips basically, with a pretty chaotic montage that I don't think anyone who hasn't seen the show would be able to parse. Then it covers episodes 65 to 70 pretty slowly, from the 35 minute mark to an hour to be exact, so like a full half hour in those five episodes. And then it basically skips to episode 74 and 75, which sees us through to the end of the movie at about 20 minutes. Really bizarre. By the way, it's not a situation where like there are long sections of Dogram you can just cut out and it'll basically make sense. I mean, I guess you could. You could do that with any story of appropriate rewrites, but there's very little new animation in this, so it just kind of teleports around the plot. It also probably goes without saying that with an approach like this, there's basically no character development. There's just too many events to go through for there to be any sort of personal arcs to follow. In fact, most of the Fang and the Sun characters aren't even named in this. If I was to say who the main character of this movie is, um, Lakoku, I guess? Kryn is rendered even more static, and he disappears for very long periods of time. Lakoku probably has the most actual development in this version, but then 
even he doesn't have that much screen time. I think there's ways they could have solved these issues. One would be to really lean into the documentary angle. You could have interviews of the characters presented as having been recorded after the conflict, in which they provide more context to their actions, their own personal experiences, and their internal headspace at the time. I know it's kind of a wacky idea, but if you're going to do the faux documentary thing, you might as well commit to it. I mean, don't get me wrong, compilation movies are a very hard task at the best of times. The Dogram series is about 26 hours of content. There's no magic way to edit that into an hour and 20 minutes. And I'm sure that when you're editing something like this, you probably become super aware of how much time gets eaten away trying to establish the most basic concepts. And I'm usually very forgiving of these things. I think compilation movies have their purpose. I mean, I fully recognize that most people are not going to watch a really long mecha show from the 70s or 80s. So usually when people decide to watch compilations, I'm like, yeah, if there's no way you're ever going to watch the TV version, go for it. It's just not realistic to expect most non-crazy people to sink that level of time into these things. Compilations can be a good way to get a taste of the aesthetics and key moments of a significant series that you otherwise wouldn't experience. But even with that in mind, I really can't see who this movie would appeal to. The documentary idea is neat, but not really emphasized enough. If you've seen the TV show, well, I guess it would be nice to be reminded of it again after it finished airing, but it isn't like the Gundam movies, which had lots of really nice new animation and music. So it just makes me wonder, what did they want to achieve with this movie? It always seemed to me that the Gundam compilations partially came about as a way to give that series another chance after it did so well in reruns. Also, Sunrise probably knew that they were going to make a sequel at some point. In a time before easy access to VHS, allowing the audience to more easily refresh themselves and the plot in theatres made sense. But then, I get the impression Sunrise knew this project did not succeed. Takashi's next mecha success, Votoms, received no compilation movie. His series Panzer World Galliant did, but that was two films adapting a 26 episode show. I think it was pretty clear that, despite the documentary concept being a good idea, this compilation of a 75 episode series did not work. What did work pretty well was this cute short they did the same year. Choro Q Dogram is a super deformed movie, only around 9 minutes long. They did these for a lot of mecha shows at the time, I dig it. It's a nice way to play with the character dynamics in a less serious format. Especially with what a downer Dogram's ending is, it's kind of nice to see the characters play around in chibi form. The the plot of this is that the fate of Dolores is decided through a race between two combat armors. Oh, and the robots are presented as giant wind-up toys. Cute, right? So there's also this short animation that was released in 1987, like six whole years after the show. It's called Dogrum vs. Round Facer, and it's pretty much what that name implies, just those two suits facing off and having a little battle. This one is weird because it's only three minutes long, and in theory, it's like a little tribute to the series, except it doesn't really capture anything about Dogrum's vibe. Like yes, this is the Dogrum, and yes, this is the Round Facer, but they don't behave anything like their TV show counterparts. This Dogrum can fly and operate in space, and then at the end there's a big alien spaceship for some reason. I'm not complaining, I quite like watching this little short. It's cool to see what these designs are like in high detail animation, for one. But for four decades, this was the only piece of Dogrum material produced after the original. Until... A few years ago, Yasuo Uragaki of Gundam Thunderbolt fame announced he would be working on a Dogram remake manga. So obviously I had to get on that. It's called Dogram Get Truth, which is a reference to the show's tagline. Odagaki, by the way, your schedule is insane. You're already working on Gundam Thunderbolt, Gundam spin-off mangas, Netflix shows, and this. Dude, your wrist exploded, what are you doing? I have to say though, this thing looks incredibly metal. I can't read Japanese, so for now I just gotta go by the images alone, but flicking through these pages, I am hyped. There are clearly some changes to the story, but it doesn't look like a radical departure, so much as it is the series filtered through Odagaki's muscular, hard edge style. And honestly, what a perfect combination. I can totally see why Dogram is a property that would appeal to him. Gundam Thunderbolt shows a love for both real robot aesthetics and also Gekiga style characters, and that is very much this work. Speaking of which, the characters seem largely the same, but with minor changes. Corinne looks notably older, for instance. Daisy seems to be less wide-eyed and naive. She's giving off more Sundere energies. It's nice, I like it. And the Fang of the Sun team has never looked better. Odagaki has basically managed to keep their designs unchanged, while imbuing them with much more fiery energy with his shaky lines and contorted faces. And they even kept Billy. The first thing I did when I got this was check if he was in it. I was like, surely they'll have made his design less ridiculous. But nope, there he is. 
The mecha have also never looked better. Oriaki really emphasizes Dogram's modularity. Like, look at this cool claw he's got. And while none of these designs have been fully overhauled, their proportions have been touched up in a way that feels reminiscent of Votoms. Basically, they seem like the platonic ideal of Dogram's combat armors. Like the series, the environmental design is somewhat grounded in contemporary aesthetics, though Oregaki goes for a slightly more futuristic sensibility with the vehicles and stuff. And especially on Earth. I like this page, which shows us the ornate mansion of the Crin family, looking just as it did in the anime. But then this other panel shows us that in this version, that mansion is on top of a skyscraper in this giant megacity. So some slightly more high concept imagery in this one. Story-wise, as far as I can tell, this isn't a direct adaptation. This version opens in media res with a few flashbacks to get us up to speed on how Crin got to the lawyer. Obviously, I can't tell about speaking Japanese, but going by the comparable lack of scenes of the political figures, Odiaki seems to be a bit more focused on the guerrilla combat, at least for now. There also seem to be new antagonists, and generally, this looks like a story that takes the setup of Dogram and goes for its own narrative, but without fundamentally altering the vibe. So I wonder if this could ever become an OAV, or some sort of anime project. I can't imagine us getting a TV show, I, I just don't think Sunrise or any production company really is going to air a mecha series of these designs and this sensibility. It's just not the market for it anymore. But this seems like the kind of thing that could work as a movie project or something. I mean, it's actually kind of surprising to me that this is the first Dogram revival we've had. You'd have thought in the 90s, when they were doing all those mecha reboots that didn't really have anything to do with the initial IP, you could have seen like, I don't know, like a Pretty Boys in like mecha armor series called like Dogram Phalanx or something. Or like maybe in the 2000s you'd get like a Dogram reboot with clamp designs and, and like a mute moe girl who pilots a Dogram and it'd be called like Dogram Feather or something. I mean even Votom's got a few of those. I don't mean that in a snooty way, I would love to live in an alternate universe with weird Dogram revivals. But oh boy, few things would make me more excited than an anime of this Dogram manga. Hell, you can even make it fully CG, I'll still be somewhat hyped. Sunrise, I know you're listening, you keep demonetizing my videos. Please make a Dogrum Get Droof anime. Okay, I'm getting towards the end of this thing, but while I have you, let me go through some of the episodes I really like. Episode 24 is this prison break episode that takes a lot of cues from movies like Escape from Alcatraz. It's a show at its most gritty, with visuals dominated by harsh greys and browns. Cool stuff, very hard-boiled and noirish. I also get the impression that this episode might have been quite influential on Armored Trooper Votoms, the series this team did right after. Episode 34 is one of the episodes that is impressive to me, just for how intensely dry it's willing to be. That's right, it's the farming monopoly episode. It's largely about Rick Boyd's attempts to break up Earth-owned farming monopolies and institute land reform. What other shows would have an episode like this? I mean, Gasaraki's bread arc comes close, but that's kind of about it. Episode 35 is the episode in which Daisy starts to work as a nurse at an independent hospital. It's a really impressive ground level view of the conflict, and it's actually pretty harrowing in showing the effects of what's been going on. I also love Crin's pure shock in this episode at seeing Daisy coming into her own after he's kind of dismissed her before then. Good stuff. In episode 38, we have some of my favourite political action in the series. In it, the guerrillas try to reach a mine that is jointly owned by three federation states who are sympathetic to the Dlorian cause. Rick Boyd absolutely freaks out, realising that if he invades the mine, he'll massively alienate those three states, which he thinks could potentially cause an Earth-based civil war. And it has what I think is my favourite scene in the whole show. Rick, after going to the mine owners and realising they've already made a deal with the guerrillas, decides Fuck it, I'm just going to intercept the gorillas myself and plead with them. Which he does, and he just lays everything out on the table. He says, I know Dlorins are impressed, I've seen it with my own eyes, but I believe in reform. I believe we can do this, we can work diplomatically. And Samalin basically says, you're a good man, Rick, but this isn't an equal conversation, and you know that. And what do you know? There's a whole battalion of Federation soldiers watching in the hills. Just great stuff. I also really like the two-parter that comes in episode after this, which focuses on these Federation grunt pilots who are just so done with the Dogram because, well, it's killed all their pals. 
who can blame them? Understandable. Also, this isn't like an episode, but um, episode 60 to 70 is just an amazing run. Just banger after banger. I can't go into detail without spoiling it, but I'll just say the show is firing on all cylinders at this point. Engaging political scheming, insane action, and also the best the show ever looks. Oh, I also want to mention that the first episode of Dogram is kind of weird. You know how like a lot of old American TV pilot episodes weren't really intended to be a linear start of the story? They were more meant to exist outside of continuity. You know, just to give the networks a taste of what a typical episode would be. Well, that's sort of what this is. It opens with Canary looking at the wreck of the Dogram, and then cuts to a story of the Fang of the Sun fighting in the war. The story that is presented actually doesn't totally work in the show's eventual continuity. We see Daisy and Lurtov meet for the first time on Lawyer, for instance, even though in the show they actually meet for the first time on Earth. And it takes place in this location called Dome City, which is never mentioned in the rest of the series. Anyway, yeah, it's a pretty okay taster of what Dogram would end up being. Dogram is obviously pretty much forgotten, and that's understandable. Clearly, it's not been looked after by its parent companies. I mean, look at how bad this transfer is. You can see the wear and tear on the individual animation cells. There's also no Blu-ray release, and there's no sequels that would make people want to go back and seek out the original. Plus, even if you are a mecha enthusiast, I can see why it would make sense to skip over Dogram and just watch Photoms. Looking at the shows side by side, you might just think, oh yeah, Dogram was kind of a stepping stone, right? To get to the really gritty aesthetics of Takashi's later series. And there are reasons why Dogram hasn't stayed in our collective imagination. The imagery is not as compelling or original as Gundam's, for instance, and it doesn't have the stylish character designs or the raw charisma of characters like Char, or the transcendent metaphysical imagery. So Dogram is a historical footnote, watched now by I guess Battletech fans and some Takashi completionists. Well liked by those who have seen it, but an obscure work nonetheless. Here's the thing though, that is a massive shame. Because Dogram is a show so good, it gives me a kind of existential anxiety. No, really, it does. When I watch a show this good, this considered in its writing, and this forgotten, I become genuinely anxious. Because I think Dogram deserves to be remembered. I want it to be remembered. If there's such a thing as an anime canon, I want Dogram in it. What it sets out to do won't be for everyone, but make no mistake, this is a show that executes on what it wants to achieve. Dogram now is a rusted behemoth, just like the suit's eventual fate in the series. It's huge and unwieldy, 75 episodes, and it's been weathered by time, thick with rust and yellow grime. But it's out there, in the desert of anime, and it's waiting to be rediscovered. Though, I hope it doesn't just deteriorate to ash.